All right, guys, take a look at what I have going on here. So I'm actually switching out all my egg boxes, <coughs> and I'm going away from the 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 perlite with the grate. And I'm switching all over to to the vermiculite with the press and seal. So um, I noticed on these eggs. So these are supposed to hatch the 9th of June. Um, so still in a couple, few weeks, and. Uh, they are just a lot more dehydrated than I would like to see. I, you know, once they get to this point, um, I'm not sure if it's very good for the eggs. So see, these are some of the, the earlier ones when the, the incubator was still a little bit too dry. I think they might hatch okay on these. This one's probably maybe a question mark. The other ones I think will probably be okay, but I noticed uh, some of my other ones that were a bit more humid, I didn't have that problem. So, and I didn't notice on these; it seemed like they're they're getting um, I don't know. It looks like a little bit like moldy or something on the bottom, a little discolored. So, I don't think this is the best setup. Maybe too much water. So, I'm switching my all my eggs, the whole thing over. Um, to this. The only one I'm not switching over is the hatchlings. So I think as soon as they hatch, I might actually go to, to something like this just to keep the hatchlings, you know, clean and a little more humid. Um, and I might just um, I might just put the, the top right on for the hatchlings, and so they have some air. And it's not completely sealed. But that's kind of the setup I'm going to now. So look at these eggs. These are. Um, Supposed to hatch on the 29th of May, and it's the 19th today, so still 10 days. But uh, again, with these, they're a bit more dimpled than I'd like to see. Um, I don't know. I think they just got too dry early on in the incubation. And these, whoo! These, I might move these all together. So, if you're, if you're timing them, uh, 55 days uh, is the normal incubation. And my, some of my first batches, I actually had hatch um, four days late. And I talked to another breeder, and he said actually that um, at the higher altitude here, at, we're at 9,000 feet, that his ball pythons hatch actually um, typically five days late, which is amazing. So I'm just putting on the GLAD uh, press and seal and making sure it's um, pressed on as, as good as I can get it. And uh, just putting the cover back on and then labeling the, moving the labels over on the box. And it's just a 50-50 a vermiculite water. I, I'm pretty much sticking with just 200 grams of vermiculite and 200 grams of water. Alright guys, take a look at this. So. You know my dog, Amani, my Rhodesian Ridgeback girl, she's ready to have babies any day. But this girl right here, <laughs> her name's Iris, she's my Jersey milk cow. And this year she will have her third calf. Yeah, you're such a sweetie. Huh? And look at her bag. Her bag's getting bigger and bigger every day. She is going to be the first one out here with these cows to calf. So, um, stay tuned for an update on her. Alright guys, so one more time I'm going to go and see if we have any puppies from this crazy dog. And today I got her a treat, a little piece of rawhide. And she looks pretty excited. Alright, let's see. Let's see what we got. <laughs> oh boy, huh? Do you have any puppies? Alright, let's look. Let's look. All right, here we go. Here. All oh. right, there's no puppies in here. Ah, she loves ride. Ooh, yeah. I'm hoping, uh, so I ordered some metal vents for these. <laughs> She's just like gnawing this away. I was hoping uh, the vents would come in before she actually got to the, the, the tube here. This is for my heater and air conditioning for this little dog hut here. So... <laughs> 
She is going crazy. But no puppies, and I took out, basically I took out all the blankets except one little blanket. So, uh, not today. <laughs> Check out Chakotay. He's my St. Bernard. <laughs> he's, he's shedding like crazy. He's got big patches out of his side. <laughs> Look at that. <laughs> this is coming off. You're crazy. Oh my goodness. Huh? <laughs> One of the thing about outside dogs is <laughs> they can dig holes, they can bark, they can shit all over the place and <laughs> just be a dog. And <laughs> it doesn't matter. Huh? It doesn't matter. You're just having fun. Yeah, you're just having fun. So today I want to talk about breeding ball pythons. And the first thing I want to talk about is temperature. So here's my breeder rack of females. I have nine levels. And believe it or not, <laughs> I actually have nine different heat controllers. So actually, uh, these Herbstat 4s, uh, they control uh, four different levels. And I have two of them. So, uh, and then with this other VE300, uh, I can actually have one probe per level and dial them all in exactly. And uh, I think it's really important to have, those. that's actually controlling the hot spot in the back of the tub. So the very backs of the tub, um, there's basically heat panels back there. And that controls the hot spot. So typically, I think what most breeders do is, for instance, they'll have like this hatchling rack here. And on the hatchling rack, I just actually have a VE100. It's just basically um, one heat controller. And I'll set that like, I'll put the probe like right in the middle of the rack, right in the back on the, the heat strip. And basically what it does is, I don't know if you can see it, but it's, I have this huge power strip that all the levels plug into and that plugs into my heat controller and it basically controls the whole rack but the problem is is the middle of the rack and I set the heat, the hot spot to 90 the middle of the rack's 90 the, and the tops and the bottoms are going to be a little bit colder and for the hatchlings I don't think it really matters that much but I think for breeders you definitely want to dial in uh, your hot spot and the other thing I really don't do is some people set it to 90 then they'll open the tub and they'll take a heat gun and, and they'll measure the temperature of the snake and the temperature of the tub and, I, and, and they'll kind of tweak it and I don't mess with any of that I just <laughs> I just set them all to 90 for the hot spot and that's it so my ambient temperature I actually set to 81 and the, the way I do it <laughs> I kind of turned it off for the video but I have this, um, this, it's basically like a box fan air filter and then um, just a space heater. And I run it up on this little, uh, it's a little uh, greenhouse thermostat. And these are really super accurate. And you can, um, you can dial in the temperature exactly. And so what I'll do is I'll, <laughs> I have it turned off now, but, so if you, if you put the, the the heater upright it turns on and then I'll turn this fan to high and so what that does is it, is it takes the hot air and it blows it into here and then it disperses it in the room and then this I kind of put in the stream of the air coming out so uh, it really maintains uh, tight temperature. If it gets a little too warm back here um, this turns off and it kind of waits for the whole room to heat up but uh, I basically turn it off for the video <laughs> and then what I do is uh, I basically have carbon filter pads these are like ready to be vacuumed or replaced so I usually get let them get about this bad and then I can usually vacuum them a few times and this really helps with the smell, especially for the, the rats in here. And uh, I'll actually put them up against this when it's going. And it'll, it'll, uh, it'll filter the air. And, th and that works really good to, to filter the air and keep it at 81. 
So a lot of people, I think almost everyone, <laughs> they, uh, they adjust their temperatures throughout the year and they consider it one of the triggers for breeding. So if you actually look at, at one of these, um, you can actually go into the menu and um, uh, you can actually, well, I won't go through the whole menu, but um, you, you can set like a night drop and see there's a day temp and a night cycle and um, I don't I don't actually do the let me see if I can go back here <laughs> yeah exit menu so. so basically there's a night drop menu and most people set the night drops during the breeding season and and the problem with that is I, I've actually messed with my temperatures a little bit when I first started and I found that if you adjust your temperatures even a little bit your snakes go off feed and uh, the last thing you want is your females to go off feed at the beginning of the breeding season because <laughs> you want them to eat as much as possible so I've been leaving my my hot spots at 90 degrees year-round and my ambient temp at 81 year round with no night drops at all. Okay, so the first thing you need to breed is a male and a female. <laughs> so what I do, um, the first thing you have to do is sit down and figure, all right, which male are you going to pair with your female? And uh, I actually have a whole schedule here um, that I wrote down. So, so basically what I'll do is I'll I'll have all my females laid out here and all my males that I want to pair. And then at the bottom I have actually five females that aren't ready to breed so they're kind of just in limbo here. And uh, so then I know exactly what's going with what. And then every single day, I don't know if you can read this, you don't really need to, but <laughs> so every single day through the whole breeding season uh, I have which male is going with which female and then the next day I move the male to a new tub the next day a new tub next day a new tub so every day I come in and I grab like the scaleless head and I move it from this tub over to this tub and when I first started um, I was doing five days on and two days off so basically I mean during the during the breeding season it's usually like five months I'd say so basically what I do is just grab the scaleless head and I move them over to one of the females and and the first day like on Monday or the first day after the break basically you're moving all of the males over and then some of the males are like are like like permanent like when I paired up this um, when I paired up the bumblebee I only paired one male so what I do is I grab the fire pie that's what I bred with her and uh, put the fire pie in with the bumblebee and they were together the whole week now the scaleless head I actually paired to five females this year so so he's like hopping around through the whole rack jumping around and then when I first started basically I take my my males out and I put them back in here and then on a, on a, on a Saturday and then I'd feed them on Saturday, give them a Sunday off, and then put them back. But the problem is, is I had some that kept regurgitating. So this guy especially, this albino pied male, he regurgitated like three or four times. I was like, what in the world is going on? And then I, I kind of figured out, it, I was moving them and breeding them too soon after feeding. So... And I actually had some females regurgitate too, which is kind of, and it, and it was my albino. <laughs> so I had this, uh, this albino head pie and she regurgitated a few times too. And um, so to kind of, so I finally figured out what was wrong is I was just moving them too fast after they were eating. So then what I did is I kind of changed my schedule to five days on and four days off. So five days of breeding or moving the males and breeding and breeding all the different females and then I put them back in their tubs feed them and then I give them at least two to three days after feeding to kind of recover 
And after I did that, it seemed like I had no regurgitation issues at all. So I actually had my schedule set up to breed for six months. And then uh, some of them started ovulating. And basically when they ovulate, um, they're pretty much done. And that's when they ovulate, the, that's when the eggs are fertile. And you can pair up after that, but it doesn't do any good. So um, when I was, you know, doing the ovulation, uh, I'd seen ovulation, I'd mark it on the tub. And then, then when I'd mark it on the tub, I'd go back to my spreadsheet. And I have all this in Excel. And what I'd do is I'd basically, like, delete that female out of the whole rotation and it would change the male so it's like from that point forward and this was just on and on and, and every day I kind of checked the mark and pretty soon it was <laughs> I, had the, I had the dates on here actually originally and then I started going to the longer breaks instead of two days and then the dates didn't really line up and, and I actually had to go out to like six months and I found that like after five months uh, I don't think I went all the way to six months but after five months, um, a lot of my snakes started ovulating. So, like here, I didn't check it off. And I just stopped my season early because um, um, a lot of the females were ovulating. And as soon as they ovulate, I was pulling them out of the, the cycle. And then what I did is I basically stopped breeding, put all my males back. It was the end of the season. And then I noticed I had a couple females... That just didn't look like they were going so um, what I did is I kind of followed up with uh, like a final copulation <laughs> kind of at the last minute so this was like in April that uh, I kind of threw them in there May April and then uh, yeah so so like on this one this was like the third of April that was the last copulation and then uh, the 7th of May was the ovulation uh, and it's kind of nice just to, to, to have all the labels on the tubs. That way you can just kind of look. You know, you figure out which ones lay eggs, uh, which ones are ready to go, which ones are off feed. Kind of when they copulated and when the ovulation was. And, you know, once they ovulate, then you take them out of the, the breeding cycle. So it's nice to, to have it all there. And, you know, I always figure if something happens to me, you know, I get hit by a bus or <laughs> who knows what. You know, it's, it's always good to have, you know, the whole all the genetics and everything right on the tub so if someone comes in and they you know they they try to resurrect my collection of snakes they can look right on the tubs and you know any breeder would know exactly what's in the tub so i know you know some people unexpectedly pass away and nobody knows what their snakes are and uh, it's really nice to label everything so then there's a lot of people that track um you know the ovulations, the sheds, when they expect eggs, and they write it all down. They track it, and I don't really track anything. <laughs> you know, I I basically just do the I put the ovulations on here just so I can figure out the males, um, but I don't really track when I'm going to have eggs. And and basically what I do is every day is I just open up the tub in the morning and the evening and look. There's no eggs, and I'll move on to the next tub. And you're checking anyway for, um, you know, if they made a mess. So, um, that's, yeah, I don't really track as, as much as most people, I think. So I actually picked up this little ultrasound. It's, it's pretty cool. Um, it's a neat little gadget to have. Uh, and I've used it a few times. Maybe I'll do another uh, a video just on the ultrasound. And most breeders say that um, you know you can palpate the snakes so basically you're just feeling for the um, the basically immature eggs in the snake and and technically they say um, you know I've read that you know if they're 10 millimeters then you can breed and you should pair them up at 10 millimeters 23 millimeters 33 43 and then one last time at 46 and uh, I don't know it's it just seemed like it was really confusing to me. So for me, I would rather just put the mail in there for five months <laughs> and then you don't have to worry about it. And you hit all those all at the same time. You know, and you're not kind of blindly guessing and missing and everything. So, And I think that's one of the keys for me that, um, 
that I had basically so I've had you know over 60 eggs and only one slug so you know that's pretty good odds and, and I think it's I think the key to that is to have the male in with the female as much as possible during those five months. So I actually do have some snakes that aren't going to go this year. Um, here's one female. I don't think she's going to go. Um, and it was just because she wasn't eating. She locked a lot the whole year. She kept lo She probably locked a couple dozen times with the male. And uh, she's just not going to go. And what I do, um, I don't really push the snakes. So uh, if they're not going to go, I just separate them and um, I give them a break after the pairing and then just wait till the next year. That way it's kind of timed so, so you're not like breeding all year round all the time. It's, it's kind of, it cuts it down to a specific season. So once they lay eggs, uh, I've showed you my incubator before but uh, I can kind of show you. So I, I basically put all my eggs in this incubator and then I, uh, I've actually switched them all to, um, to vermiculite with the uh, press and seal and then I label them with uh, um, the pairing, the date laid, and the, and the date of the hatch. And uh, I, I built this incubator out of a beverage cooler and what I did is I just used a it's a VE100, uh, I guess it's a VE300 in the bottom. And then I put a couple a couple fans in the back. You can see them back there. Just to give it a little air movement. And then I hooked up, I actually ran a couple heat panels on the back. And I found it wasn't enough. So then I actually went to Reptile Basics and had them uh, pre-cut these. Um, the ones on the side. So basically it has... Um, they're basically totally surrounded <laughs> with the heat tape, and it's been working fantastic. You know, I, uh, I set it at 90, and my my temperature usually always says uh, 88. So, so the other thing is the size of the females, and most people say that you need at least 1,500 grams uh, out of, in a female to to, to breed, but. I found, so this girl, she actually started the season at 1,500 grams. And if they're eating well, they'll actually increase as they go. So, I think it's just a rule of thumb. So this, this girl up here, she was 1,359. And uh, she actually uh, didn't really eat that well during the breeding season. So she stayed fairly small, but she still laid a bunch of eggs. And probably my smallest male, <laughs> I really pushed this guy, the scaleless head male. And when he started the season, he, believe it or not, he was only 400 grams. So um, we can actually weigh him right now and, and see what he weighs. But um, he's definitely probably double that right now. So yeah, he's like 820. <laughs> So, uh, what's well, funny though, he's, he was, ha so he was like half the size when I started him. So, I mean, he's a really good size now to, to breed, but it almost looked comical because I was pairing him with some of my biggest snakes and I paired him with his head caramel over here. She hasn't laid yet, um, but, and she's in shed too, but <laughs> the funny thing is, is I had this humongous snake, almost 4,000 gram, and then I had this little tiny 400 gram male <laughs> kind of crawling over her belly. <laughs> and I thought, no way are those guys going to mate, but um, they actually did, and I actually got some some uh, some eggs out of some of my bigger ones with the with that small scaleless head, and that one's definitely going to go this year. So. Um, that you can actually do it with the smaller male. So I guess kind of the last thing is um, uh, I always wondered if if you should pair up while the female are shedding or the male is shedding. I don't know. I, I put them together and I just kind of worked them through the whole cycle. And um, it, I, I, you know, I kind of ignored if they didn't eat or if they ate or if they shed or what was really going on. And I just kind of kept 
moving them through the whole pairing and taking a break and feeding them. And I did notice that if they're shedding and you pair them up, a lot of times they won't lock. So, I don't know, I, I just kind of went through the motions and it worked really well and I just kind of <laughs> ignored what was going on with the snake and it worked really well. So, um, I paired them up and they, most almost every time when they were shedding they didn't lock. So I guess the last thing is, um, so I actually started pairing up in October and most people start pairing in November or December. Um, so I'm kind of ahead of the game and a lot of people um, don't have that many eggs yet. Um, I don't know, I thought I'd get a jump on it because I know a lot of times at the shows in the fall there's a lot of people still waiting on eggs or have stuff that just hatched that hasn't eaten yet in their display case. So that's pretty much all I have for breeding. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to post them and I'll get back to you. So thanks for watching.